let me set up my screen. Uh, I'm not so familiar with this app here, actually. So give me a second. There was supposed to be a green uh, share screen button. Right. Okay. And I'm also on somebody else's computer, so that makes it extra difficult. Uh, slides are here. So this is going to be, I was actually expecting a smaller meetup. <laughs> I didn't realize it was going to be like 70 people. Um, so this is a bit of a technical talk. I thought I would take an opportunity to talk about some things that, uh, that I'm not normally talking about. Uh, with the idea that this was more of, um, yeah, more more kind of people familiar with with uh, uh, internal details of of Node and uh, that sort of stuff, like like Benjamin is. But um, so you know, forgive me if if this is if this is like too much information or uh, too technical information, but. Yeah, unfortunately, I'm not going to talk about kind of the the surface level Dino stuff and the motivation be, behind that. I mean, I've, I think there's there's a lot of uh, content already about that stuff. Um, by the way, can people see my screen? Am I doing this correctly? Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. So uh, this is going to be more about just a, a brief little overview of kind of the internal organization of of Dino. Uh, it's uh, something that we've spent a lot of time and thought on and is actually, you know, the, the basis of the, of the project. Um, the Dino started probably as far back as 2015 with a project called uh, V8 Worker, which was a binding to V8 in, in Go that I was working on. And the basic idea of V8 Worker was, was that I wouldn't allow people writing Go to just use V8's APIs and uh, create random JavaScript objects, but rather force people to do into a message passing uh, system where they, they pass messages back and forth between Go and, and V8. Uh, so that project uh, has been revised many times and has eventually become this, this Dino project that, that you know of. Um, <clears throat> But uh, yeah, so I, I just want to kind of give give a bit of an overview of of how this looks from the inside and and uh, how how we think about the the internal system. <clears throat> um, so Dino is is unlike Node is not uh, organized as as a monolithic project. Although you you download this executable and this is kind of the most visible aspect of the project. Uh, we've spent a lot of time trying to organize it in terms of uh, Rust crates. So uh, it's kind of broken up into these four chunks, uh, these four pretty pretty big chunks of, of code uh, that expose kind of different layers of abstraction to the system. What you, what everybody thinks of Dino is this is this first one, this the Dino executable. Uh, this is by far the the big, where all of our time is, is going. But what I'm going to talk about more in this talk is kind of these lower layers, uh, the Dino core and Rusty V8 crates. Uh, so, you know, this is of particular interest to anyone who has a project. <clears throat> well, let me put it this way. Not every project, uh, you know, wants to use Node or Dino as, as a top level executable. There's many systems where you might want to embed a JavaScript runtime. Uh, and we think, you know, obviously Dino itself is a system where we want to embed a JavaScript runtime, but we think there's, there's other use cases for that. Uh, and that's kind of where, where these different crates come in. Um, so yeah, <clears throat> so you, you know, you might, Ask why? Why is it useful to to avoid this this monolithic design that that we had in Node? Um, and 
yeah, I mean, it's a good question. I mean, there, there you know, <laughs> maybe you don't care at all, uh, but if you do care, um, there's, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of effort that kind of goes into maintaining all these different interfaces. And it's, it's certainly uh, a bit more difficult. It's a lot more design work than having kind of the, the monolithic design. Um, but I think it has a lot of benefits uh, in particular that, uh, you know, it's just better organizationally in, in the code base itself. Uh, if you're if you're familiar with with node and and what the source code of of that looks like i mean it's it's a very large c++ project right um, and yeah it, similarly with dino i mean this this thing is providing a lot of functionality uh, and so breaking this up allows us to kind of test subsystems independently um, you know like like anyone would in any sort of project you you want to you want to kind of break up things into independent parts and this just becomes really important for us because it's just such a complicated system uh, and uh, you know being able to test say the v8 binding layer to rust independently of other parts of the system is, is very important uh, so yeah it, it just makes our our, our testing setup and and a bit better when we have these these defined uh, layers to interface with, um, <clears throat> and it, I I think the the thing that I'm going to talk about in this talk the most is is that it provides this uh, principled binding layer. Uh, but I'll I'll discuss that more. And you know I think the the situations where you would be interested in this are not your everyday situations. If you're building a website, you just want to use the executable. Okay, we're we're trying to think beyond that. Uh, you know, if, if you're building, say, an electron style app, maybe you want to distribute your own executable that has, you know, a bunch of uh, GUI code, native GUI, GUI code in it, but you also want to somehow provide the ability to, to script in JavaScript. Uh, so electron style apps, uh, you can imagine something like a database, some database that provides, say, some JavaScript that can be run as a, as a MapReduce. Uh, you know, that's a situation where you might want to embed a JavaScript uh, VM. Or uh, this, this uh, so-called serverless use case, where you know, essentially you have a, a web server and you want to uh, handle some of these requests in, in, uh, in JavaScript. So, you know, the maybe couch, couch uh, sorry, uh, Cloudflare workers is, is kind of a, a situation where they've essentially embedded V8 into, into their, their uh, very large uh, web server system. <clears throat> so, right, <laughs> I'm guessing that of, of the 86 people listening to this, uh, not many of you have these concerns, uh, but uh, this is, you know, the, when, when it does become a concern, you know, you don't, if you're, if you're, say, if you're Cloudflare and you're trying to make Cloudflare workers, you don't want to fork out to, to Node just to execute some JavaScript. And ideally, uh, I'll make the case for this, uh, ideally you're not using V8 directly itself because that's, that's pretty hairy. So we, we think there's kind of this, this middle ground of, um, of functionality that to provide. Um, so I'm just going to walk through these these crates kind of in reverse order from from lowest level to, to highest level. Um, so first we've got this this rusty V8 crate, and what this does is it essentially tr provides the the V8 C++ library uh, in Rust, uh, which you know one would think is is uh, is an easy task, but it's it's, it's very very non-trivial. Um, so v V8, uh, if you're not aware, is a C++ library, and it's very massive and very complex. It's like 800,000 lines of code. Uh, you know, we're, we're talking on complexity on the order of the space shuttle, right? This is, this is a very complex system. And, you know, building it, for example, takes, I don't know, 30 minutes to an hour, depending on your computer. Um, so... You know, it, it, V8 is, uh, 
its its API surface area is is also extremely large. Uh, you know, I'm not sure how many functions it, and classes it actually exposes, but I would definitely put it in the hundreds, if not thousands, of functions that it exposes. There's a lot of knobs, <laughs> right? V8 runs the world, and it's not surprising that this thing is 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 a beast. So what we're trying to do in, in Rusty V8, and let me just switch tabs here and see if I can kind of pull, let me see. Can you guys see this? Can you hear me at all? Maybe. Can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> Okay, good, 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 good. Okay, sorry. Um, just had had a fear for a second that I was uh, talking to myself. Uh, so, sorry, I just I said the configuration, so everyone is muted because people started talking. <laughs> oh, I see, I see. So if I switch tabs here, can you guys see this other tab? Uh, no, see this? We, we only see the slides. Oh, I see. All right, well, whatever. Uh, present. Wait, sorry, guys. I'm really not used to giving slides. Okay, here we go. All right, uh, I was going to show you the Crates I.O. page, but it's not so important. Um, <clears throat> anyway, so so this, this Rusty V8 crate uh, is, uh, yeah, I mean, you can think of it as as basically a framework for adding bindings, Rust bindings to C++. Uh, yeah, you might naively think that this 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 is not such a big big task, but uh, this this took us a good, I would say, six months of of work to kind of find the right way to to create bindings to to Rusty to um, to Rust. Um, so. You know some properties of, of Rusty V8 is that this is this is a zero cost uh, binding. So in Rust, when you are manipulating V8 objects, you are dealing with exactly the objects that you deal in the C++ library. So you know, for example, in Rusty V8, there's a handle scope, and that is exactly the same handle scope that you deal with in in uh, C++ V8. So we've been very careful not to introduce any overhead at at this binding layer. Um, and uh, as you may or may not know, uh, Rust uh, is a more strict type system than C++, and we are trying to take advantage of that by uh, typing, you know, essentially providing a, a stricter set of types to V8 uh, so that when you the the op when you when you're uh, interacting with this library, the type system can force uh, uh, correct behavior. So, for example, uh, you, you can't create a a local handle outside of a handle scope uh, that's enforced by the type system, or you know the in Rust you have uh, you know these these uh, these uh, traits like send and sync which describe how uh, objects interact with uh, threads. Uh, and we've carefully and <laughs> slowly over time modified our isolate uh, types so that they uh, correspond to the correct usage patterns, which is that you know, is isolates essentially belong to a, to a specific thread. So you know, to make a long story short, we're, we're trying to do this, this uh, in a, create these these uh, safe ways to interact with a very very complex system. Um, on top of this, I think the the interesting part is um, also the the build setup. Uh, you know, unless you you've dealt with this before, you may not be aware of of the insanity that that is uh, the Chromium build system and the history behind this. But you know, there's there's uh, Building this, building a C plus an eight hundred thousand line C plus plus project that is changing very rapidly is non-trivial <laughs> to say the least. And what we've done is 
we've basically figured out a pattern to build V8 itself, that is the C++ part of V8, inside of Cargo. Uh, and this is important because uh, V8 has a lot of uh, compilation uh, settings, right? I would say tens, if not hundreds, of, of compilation settings that uh, you know are, are are things that we do change and and are important to be able to change. And so, you know, just providing a binary V8 is really not sufficient for our use cases when we're trying to support multiple platforms and you know different different uh, ISAs. Uh, <coughs> So uh, we need the ability to build V8 from scratch, and we do do that in the, uh, in the Rusty V8 repository. Every PR, we, we actually build within GitHub Actions uh, uh, the V8 binary on all three of our target operating systems for release and, and uh, debug. Uh, so we, we have this, this fairly serious uh, build setup to, to produce binaries for this thing. And uh, yeah, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that because it, it's a bit of a technical detail, but uh, the work that's gone into this uh, essentially allows us to build on top of V8 and Rust in uh, a pretty sane way. And we're able to upgrade V8 without, without uh, too much troubles. Uh, and uh, yeah, just this, this is kind of the, the foundational infrastructural work that uh, was necessary to to build really complex systems on on top of 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 you know this this really great and interesting VM. Um, <clears throat> so the Deno Core crate is built on top of the Rusty V8 crate. This is still way low level for <laughs> for anybody who who's thinking of Deno at the C CLI layer. This is still very much internal. But this is higher level than the than the V8 API. The V8 API is dealing with all sorts of details that we're trying to abstract away at this layer. Um, <clears throat> one of the so, you know, the the reason that we I'll, I'll describe the the abstractions that this that this create uh, that this crate brings. Uh, but it kind of comes from a counter counterintuitive experience that we learned when we were building Node, uh, which is that you, you kind of get this impression that JavaScript is slow and C++ is fast. And so, you know, if you're binding something into C++, that you should, you should do as much work as possible in C++. Uh, but this is often not true. Uh, so the C++ code that manipulates JavaScript objects can often be slower than the equivalent code in, in JavaScript. Uh, and furthermore, this boundary crossing problem of, of jumping from JavaScript to C++ is slower than you would want it to be. Um, and you know, I think this, this is probably very complicated, but essentially comes down to the fact that V8 is a, a JIT VM, and it's, it's doing a lot of great optimizations on your JavaScript code. Uh, and uh, you're essentially opting out of, of, those, of those optimizations when you jump into C++. Uh, so uh, yeah, we're, we're, we're going to try to develop a, a binding layer that avoids these complexities uh, or avoids these problems. <coughs> Uh, furthermore, uh, in Node, there was there's no centralized binding interface, so you know people are just adding global objects here and there, random random bindings uh, in no particular centralized fashion, uh, and so there's no way to have an I have some concept of like how many um, how many uh, uh, binding calls are being called, right? Have have you called it? How many times have you called into C++ in this in this uh, in a particular program? Can you answer that question? That is not answerable because those metrics are not being captured in in Node. In Dino, uh, in you know via this this Dino core crate, everything goes through through kind of a a, a single funnel, uh, a, a binding trampoline, if you will, where uh, we can perform all sorts of metrics or security checks uh, and just generally have a better understanding at this layer of 
how uh, the JavaScript code is is moving in and out of, of the Rust code. <coughs> um, so another problem is that in Node, many callbacks are issued from C++ without being requested from the from the JavaScript side. Uh, you know, a, a particular example of this is uh, with sockets and the data event. Um, so you 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 have a socket and and it's just publishing these these data events in kind of an unconstrained manner. Uh, so in in Node, you're just you're often you know it's not constrained to just sockets. Uh, there's just like a lot of events kind of popping out of nowhere, and you know it depends on the on the interface, but it's often uh, push events, not pull events, and this has turned out to be a fundamental design problem uh, because it cr creates many opportunities for users to create code without back pressure. Uh, this is you know, maybe a, a bit of a difficult thing to, to wrap your head around, but uh, imagine, say, that you've got a TCP server, and, you know, what this TCP server does is that it allows people to upload a file. So you have all these people connecting to the server, and they're pushing a lot of data to you, right? The, what you, TCP itself has a notion of back pressure, right? So if, if, you're, if you're uploading some data to a server, you know, and that server can't handle, if, if there's, there's some queue, and <laughs> if, if that queue fills up with, with all the packets that you're sending to it, and it's unable to process the, those, uh, that data that you're sending to it fast enough, it will, it will tell you to back off. So it will, it will somehow send, send you some signal, signals back to your computer to tell you to stop sending more data, right? And, and you know, this, this mechanism allows for, for cooperation between the server and sender to, uh, you know, negotiate kind of how fast data is being sent. Uh, and the way that the, the kernel of the server, uh, the, the TCP stack of, of, of the server is, is handling this is, uh, you know, essentially if, if uh, if the socket is not being read from, there's there's some there's some buffer in the in the kernel that uh, incoming uh, packets get get put into, and once that buffer fills up, it starts issuing these these back pressure uh, messages. Uh, in Node, if you're if you're always reading as fast as you can from these incoming events, if you're all which is you know what what it's doing with these data events, it's it's just reading. Trying to trying to read from these these buffers very quickly, uh, <clears throat> you don't get kind of the proper back pressure because you know it could be that the JavaScript side of things is actually very busy, and you're you're just kind of getting flooded with these events. But because you you continue to to read from the from the socket, uh, this creates problems. And you know so we we kind of tried to paste over this uh, in later revisions with like the pause stuff. Uh, but ultimately, this this is just kind of a fundamental design problem, and uh, you know what what we really want is is the JavaScript side of things to ask for more data when it needs it, not to be pushed more data. That is, we want some sort of pull model. Um, <clears throat> so, so in in Dino, you know, when you read from a socket, you must ask the you must ask is, issue issue a call a read call to to do this. Uh, and so in, in Dino, you don't, you don't have any callbacks that just arise from anywhere. There, everything is a, is a promise in some sense, and everything is initiated from the, from the JavaScript side. So uh, the hope is that this, uh, this solves this back pressure problem uh, kind of at, at the binding layer and uh, will ultimately uh, result in servers that have uh, better tail latency. Right, because if that's that's kind of the the um, the way that these these problems manifest themselves is uh, you you would uh, these back pressure problems you you basically get flooded with events and then you have some clients that are not being served and so they they have really poor tail latency. Um, so yeah, in in Dino we're, we're we're trying to address all of these problems kind of at this Deno core layer. And uh, so this, this Dino core is essentially a wrapper around Rusty V8 that 
uh, provides a way to bind JavaScript, native JavaScript functions, right? <coughs> and uh, <coughs> so, uh, right. Uh, so the kind of the, the core abstraction here is this op interface. Um, so an op is, is a native function that can be called from JavaScript. Uh, and this op function is binary data only. So its parameters and its return values are array buffers, nothing else. There's no strings, there's no numbers, it's only binary data. Um, and furthermore, these, these uh, parameters and return values, the, the binary da data that's, that's transferred back and forth, is zero copy. So it's not, there's no mem copying happening as you call this, this function in Rust. We're really just passing a pointer around. So you, know, you allocate some data in JavaScript in, in an array buffer, and you pass a pointer for that into Rust. Or vice versa, something gets allocated in Rust and it gets passed back into, into JavaScript as a pointer. And uh, ownership, basically, of, of that buffer gets, gets transferred to, to VA. So we've been very careful to make these op interfaces uh, uh, optimal. <coughs> and you know, the, the nice thing with this is that if we have just one, way, one binding layer, then we can put all of our effort into all of our performance effort into optimizing this, this op layer. And then any binding layer that is all bindings that are built on top of this can benefit from the performance work that performance optimizations that, that go into uh, designing these. Uh, and yeah, also the, these op things, uh, they're, they're either synchronous or asynchronous. Um, and the asynchronous versions are, are are things that, that return a promise, right? So it's, it's basically a native function that, that returns a promise. And we've got a lot of, of uh, infrastructure and in th that this Deno core creates that basically allows you to take a Rust future and turn it into a JavaScript promise. Uh, and so this is, you know, this is, this is essentially the integration into the, into the event loop. Um, you know, it, technical detail that, that uh, you might <laughs> probably nobody cares about, but D Dino Core is, is not dependent on Tokyo, uh, which is our event loop library. There are multiple event loop libraries, crates in, in Rust. Another one is async std. Uh, so we've been very careful not to tie Dino Core to any particular event loop library. So, so this is, these are abstractly tied to Rust futures, not to the event loop itself. Um, so, <clears throat> so everything in the Dino executable is built on top of ops. And uh, we have demonstrated that, that a server built with uh, Dino core can perform better than Node. Uh, so, you know, there, there's a lot of asterisks to this, <laughs> uh, to this statement, but you know, essentially, we're, we're, we're able to perform these zero copy uh, operations and not incur a performance hit. Uh, and I've linked to, a, uh, to our, ben our continuous benchmarks where we're performing these analyses on every commit. Uh, I'll, I'll post, I'll, I'll give the links to the slide later. Um, yeah, so a bit more about the Dino core crate. So, uh, you know, I talked about, talked about these ops. They are, uh, you know, native, essentially the native functions that you call from JavaScript. There's one more concept that, that Dino Core introduces, and that's resources. And you can think of a resource as a file descriptor, right? So, you know, when you open a file in C, you get this integer, you know, it's going to be like integer three or something for the, your first file. And, uh, uh, it corresponds to, to some concept, right? But it, it's just an integer. The reason we use integers is that they're, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, something that we can, that we can pass to, to JavaScript that, that has essentially zero overhead, uh, a very simple identifier to deal with. Um, and essentially these, these resources correspond to uh, things that are allocated and uh, open in Rust. So objects, objects in Rust, right? So think of an open socket or an open file. 
right? That corresponds to some Rust object somewhere. And we need a way to manipulate that Rust object. We don't bind it directly into an object in, in uh, via V8. What we do is we, we pass uh, this integer identifier, this resource ID, uh, into JavaScript. And in JavaScript, it, it can call further ops and uh, uh, parameterize by this uh, resource ID. Uh, and right, so there's a there's a resource table. Each each resource has a unique integer identifier, and uh, you can from the JavaScript side, if you want to close or or deallocate one of those of those resources, you call the deno close. Um, and so, you know, this is a really vague picture of of what things look like. Uh, but essentially, there's ops and there's resources. Right, and there's Rust and there's JavaScript, <laughs> and uh, these these ops kind of provide a way for JavaScript to call into Rust, uh, and these resources are, you know, essentially uh, Rust objects that are are referenced inside of of JavaScript. Um, so. Almost done here. The the Dino TypeScript crate. So all of uh, everything that I've described so far is JavaScript only. No concept of of TypeScript. Uh, when we start adding TypeScript to this equation, things get really complicated. Uh, and uh, this, I would just say, is is a crate that we've published, but we are still heavily iterating on on this part of of the project. And so I would say, don't don't depend on on Dino TypeScript at this time. Unfortunately, we're not able to provide a really stable way of manipulating or compiling JavaScript in Rust yet. Uh, but you know, uh, if if uh, ho hopefully over time we'll 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 be able to uh, work out this stuff. <coughs> um, <coughs> sorry. <coughs> so um, yeah, I mean. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, yeah, I, uh, that's the end of my talk. Uh, I, you know, if if you're if you're interested in this stuff, I mean, obviously this is this is quite low level for for most people. But um, yeah, I mean, if if you're interested in this, uh, send me an email. Uh, there's a lot of work to do still. Uh, and yeah, thanks thanks for inviting me and and thanks for your attention. Thank you, Ryan. I, I would like, yeah, I, I, like people would be clapping, but they can't because they're all muted. <laughs> right. <laughs> they are writing thank you in the chat. Uh, they had a few questions. Um, and like uh, when, when you asked, said like no one probably cares about the, like, the crate separation. Uh, some people like just commented, do we care? And uh, this is interesting, that sort of stuff. Vnaya uh, asked, um, let me find it. So many. Stop in chat. Uh, do you have direct FFI or another bridge layer in the CPP side? And that was about Dino Core. It wasn't about like the. Uh, yeah. So we don't have a in a proper FFI, so to speak. Uh, where in FFI, you know, I I imagine to be something where in the JavaScript side you can basically have a string that identifies a Rust function. And you can kind of abstractly call that Rust function without writing any binding code in Rust to to uh, to make that to wrap that up for into an op. Uh, this is something that we would like to do. We, it's something we would build on top of the op interface itself, and so there would be essentially an op called you know call FFI or something, and uh, we would encode. Uh, say the Rust function name and the parameters that's going to be passed to it in into one of these array buffers. Pass it over to the Rust side, uh, parse that structure, figure out which which Rust function we're going to call. Actually, call that call that function. Um, yeah, it's something we'd like to do. This whole binding interface, I, I would say, is is uh, is still under construction. Yeah, but yeah, FFI would be built on top of ops. Uh, Right. So uh, I think we have time for two more questions. So uh, one of them is: Are you planning? How are you planning to be up to date with future TypeScript versions? And another one I see is: Do you have any plans to support uh, Wasm or Wasi, like WebAssembly? 
Uh, yeah, the uh, the the WASM uh, aspect is is easier answer. It already supported, right? Because 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 uh, well, I, I, what, what, at least for 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 WASM, right? I mean, V eight is is the the web VM, and of course, is the main WASM uh, executor already. And so we we have we have support for that just via V eight. Um, uh, the WASI situation, I don't, I've seen something about that. I don't think we have support for that. And I'm not sure exactly what, uh, what the situation is with WASI right now. Um, the other question was uh, TypeScript versions. Uh, how do we keep up to date with that? Yeah, so I mean, basically, we, we are pegged to a particular TypeScript version where we're currently 3.9. We try to stay up to date with that. Uh, the hope is that TypeScript is mostly done and that this stops changing. And you know that that's probably not true in the near term. You know, obviously TypeScript is still under development and stuff, but programming languages at some point should be stable and not change. And uh, you know, the what I, I would guess that the changes in TypeScript are going to get smaller and smaller and less important to people. Uh, and so keeping up to date with that, I think, is not the biggest concern. Yeah, cool, awesome.